Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg Juggler 66, Hour of the Truth. Today we are going into the next, the 38th part of the wonderful study, Yea, hath God said. And everything that needed to be said as an introduction I said in the video before, so if you have not seen that, please go turn to the video before this one, which was called Yea, hath God said intermediate. And there you will find an explanation of what's going on in this video, what we are going to talking about, and how am I going to talk about going to talk about it. So without any further ado, let's just go to the recording that I announced that will be played in this video. The Sabbath question. This chapter is a late addition to a book which I thought was finished and serves to show how we never stop learning and should always be willing to test long-held beliefs to prove all things and hold fast that which is good. And by the way, when I'm reading here that this chapter is a late addition to a book which I thought was finished and serves to show, uh, that is not me, that is the author of the book and we will get to know him later in a different, uh, <laughs> on another time frame, <laughs> let's say, uh, when we even speak about the whole book. So don't forget what I'm talking here about, what I'm reading about, is a chapter of a book. And that book is still to be published. It is edited now, and it is very wonderful worked on by my Christian brother. And this reading I did in March, 2024 on the Sabbath question. That's why it is called this way. The subject is a very contentious one that has divided Christians for centuries. Recently, I brought it up during a study with friends and I may have lost one of them as a result. The fact that merely addressing the subject to see if we may have been deceived brought about such a strong reaction made me realize how important it was to do a much deeper study to see if scripture agrees with tradition. The fourth commandment states, quote, Remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy, unquote. Early in the fourth century, Emperor Constantine enacted that on the venerable day of the sun, the laws the law courts and all workshops should be closed and the urban population should rest. And here I have to interrupt for a little comment. In the meantime, I saw videos where someone held up a book and in that book you could read about the oration of Constantine. That is what happened when or what was said by Constantine, the pagan emperor of the Roman, pagan Roman Empire, what was said by him at the Council of Nicaea. Um, the people who uploaded the video didn't respond to once or twice me asking if they can tell me what book that was that uh, man was holding up there. Um, so the problem is that I do not know what the book actually was, but then I looked at the internet and I got me a book that uh, has printed more or less um, the complete oration of Constantine. And uh, you have to be very patient to read this book because it contains more footnotes and explanation than actual text and actual text. It does already have a lot. And that was so important because we spoke in the series of um, the um, of this in, in the series, of course, yeah, as God said, but in the discussion of the very first book, uh, the history of the doctrine of the Trinity and the Christian Church by Hugh J. Stennis, we spoke about how this Trinity doctrine came into the Church, which is of course the Roman Catholic Church, and that it was introduced at the Council of Nicaea and later on in the Council of Constantinople and in the Council of uh, Ephesus uh, and uh, Chalcedon, well, sorry, not Ephesus, but Chalcedon, and all these different councils, but it was very first in the Council of Nicaea that the Emperor Constantine made the point that God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, 
and the Holy Spirit left out in Nicaea, but talked about later on in Constantinople in 381, are of one substance, which means to say of the same quote-unquote material. They are one. This is the whole doctrine of the Trinity put in a nutshell. And in this book, The Oration of Constantine, which also uh, deals with the um, founding of the cross by the mother of Constantine, Helena, who supposedly or allegedly found the cross Jesus Christ was crucified on in the fourth century, or yeah, in the late in the late fourth century. So quite amusing actually. But all that part is also in that book. And I have read that book, or I'm I'm doing a reading of that book. I haven't quite come to the place where it says that. But I still have the video, of course, in one of my playlists, um, where this uh, man holds up the book and gives us a complete statement of what the Emperor Constantine said there about the Trinity. Now, the Trinity is not the subject of this video. In this video, we are going to talk about um, the Sabbath. And as I just read, early in the 4th century, Emperor Constantine enacted that on the venerable day of the sun, the law courts and all workshops should be closed and the urban population should rest. That is one address of one part of the oration of Constantine at the Council of Nicaea. If you want to study that for yourself, go and look up on the search engine of your choice, the oration of Constantine at the Council of Nicaea, and try to find a legitimate good work in your own language, what I'm reading is in English, not my own language, but as good as it gets. And that's why I study that also in there. So I want to go on now with uh, the audio and, and keep on playing the audio. But I just think that that is a very important thing to understand. It is also a very important thing to do your own research, as I said in the last video. Don't take anything for granted and everything that I say or everybody else says uh, is something that you have to prove, <clears throat> excuse me, that you have to prove by yourself with your own research. So get the information, get the documents, get the books, get the videos, get whatever you need to put your own eyes on the evidence mentioned by others and by that Make that knowledge your own. That is very important. Because otherwise everybody can tell you everything they want. And that's, by the way, frankly, what everybody did up to now, at least. So now wake up, and do your own research and read these things for yourself. And um, I can put the ISBN number of the book of the Oration of Constantine that I bought in the description box of this video. And then you can get it for yourself. But now, let's continue with the reading. This legal transfer of the obligations set out in the fourth commandment from Saturday, the seventh day of the week, to Sunday, the first day of the week, became one of the foundational doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church, which together with the Trinity molded Christianity into an image to the beast, as we read in Revelation chapter 13, verse 14. There is no doubt that the Sabbath day was and always will be on the seventh day, which is Saturday. And here lies our problem, because the vast majority of quote-unquote organized Christian churches come together to worship on Sunday in line with the Church of Rome. When the Protestant Reformation started in earnest, Following the publication of Luther's 95 Theses in 1517, the Protestants continued to worship on Sunday, much to the delight of Rome, who accused them of still following her authority, as there was no reference in Scripture to the transference of the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. On the surface, this and this, by the way, is something that I made a video on years and years and years ago. I think it was, must be almost about eight to nine years in the um, 
series that I did at that time, Nothing But the Truth, the Sabbath question, why didn't the reformers go all the way? That was my understanding of the Sabbath for a very long time. As I said, I have been betrayed like most of the people have been betrayed. I am absolutely no exception. Yeah. So when I read here, um, when the Protestant Reformation started in earnest following the publication of Luther's 95 Theses in 1517, the Protestants continued to worship on Sunday, much to the delight of Rome, who accused them of still following her authority, as there was no reference in Scripture to the transference of the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. Now, this is absolutely correct. You can look up the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. You will not find one verse where the Sabbath is uh, changed from Saturday to Sunday. That is purely the Church of Rome that did that. That is the Emperor Constantine who did that in 321, as we read earlier in this uh, little paper. Yeah, It was in... Uh, uh, what what does it say here? This legal transfer of the obligation set out in the fourth commandment from Saturday, the seventh day of the week, to Sunday, the first day of the week, became one of the foundational doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church. And this was early in the fourth century. I think it was 321, so even before the Council of Nicaea, when Emperor uh, Constantine changed that. So you, you can look up the whole... There is no transference of the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. That is correct, but that is not the question that we are dealing with here in this whole um, discussion. Here, the question appears more or less, is the Sabbath still something that needs to be observed by Christians of the New Covenant? That is more the point that we are going to see. Yeah, And when it says here that Rome accused them of still following her authority, because there was no reference for changing or transferring the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday, Rome was right. And in that video that I did years and years ago, I will also put the link in the description box of this video, where it says, uh, the, the, the title of the video is um, nothing but the truth, why did the uh, Sabbath question, why didn't the reformers go all the way? <laughs> all these years and I still know the title by heart. Um, in that video, and that is about three hours long, uh, we refer to the uh, Council of Trent. And in the Council of Trent that was held between 1545 and 1563, which was organized and led all the time by the Jesuit order, which was newly founded in 1540, on the 17th section, it is said that the Archbishop of Reggio made the point that the Protestants are just rebels because they keep the Sabbath on a Roman Catholic way. Because there is no, and that's what the Bishop of Reggio said, yeah, an arch-Catholic, okay, on the Council of Trent. The defining Council of Trent, where heresy was defined, where, um, you know, the, uh, the Inquisition was taken up again, um, that maybe uh, it didn't even rest, but you know, many people say, yeah, the um, the Inquisition was done in the beginning of the 16th century, and somebody said it was of the 18th century. I'm going to tell you, the Inquisition is still going on today, but that again is a completely different point. Um, the Council of Trent was forming the basis for the still today, quote unquote, modern policy and dogmas of the Roman Catholic Church. It was said there. And this Roman Catholic Archbishop said, the Protestants are just rebels of the Roman Catholic Church because they adhere to Sunday instead of Saturday, even though there's no reference in Scripture to, from the transference from Sabbath to Sunday, uh, from Saturday to Sunday. So that was dealt with there, and we do that for a little bit over three hours in that video, and uh, I really advise you to watch that. And that was, of course, in the time when I still thought we need to keep the Sabbath. Do we really need to keep the Sabbath? 
Well, today I don't think so anymore. And why is that? Well, that's here in the audio, because we still have an hour and 25 minutes to go. Seems very clear cut. Either you follow scripture, which states the seventh day Saturday, or you follow Rome and abstain from work on Sunday to keep it as a special day of worship. I used to think that way too, as worship on Sunday was clearly a Roman deception, and they even admit that it is their quote-unquote mark of authority and nothing more. As we see repeatedly, Satan is extremely subtle, the master of deception, and that appears to be the case here too. Whilst Christians are arguing over which day they should worship upon, they lose sight of the fact that Sabbath day obligations were never taught by Jesus or expected of Gentiles. Pleasing God is obviously a good thing, but trying too hard can blind our eyes to the message of Scripture and puts us in danger of trying to earn our own salvation when Christ has already paid that price for us. Many Christians cherry-pick aspects of the law from the Old Covenant, such as abstaining from eating unclean meat, doing no work on the Sabbath and observing one or more of the feast days in their own way, despite none of this being taught. And here I have to make a little intervention again. The original text does not speak of unclean meat in general. It speaks specifically of eating pork. So the author says, Many Christians cherry-pick aspects of the law from the Old Covenant, such as abstaining from eating pork, doing no work on the Sabbath, and observing one or more of the feast days in their own way, despite none of this being taught. And it is important to understand that pork is one of the unclean meats. So I had my reason when I read this the very first time to not use the term pork. And the people who uh, are involved in this study know why I did not use it. But today... I agree after even speaking with the author when he said, well, why are you using uh, a word that I didn't write? Why did you use eating uh, unclean meat instead of eating pork? I gave him the reason and he gave me a contra reason why I should use it. And he is absolutely correct. So it reads here, and I will tell you now that the original sentence in the book sounds like, Many Christians cherry-pick aspects of the law from the Old Covenant, such as abstaining from eating pork, doing no work on the Sabbath, and observing one or more of the feast days in their own way, despite none of this being taught. This is the original text. I altered it in the moment when I read this in the month of March, but I see now that that was not correct and that I should have used pork. I am not uh, how, how do you how do you say that? I'm I'm, I'm not taking into uh, consideration the personal feelings of someone um, who maybe thinks that he is addressed here, and um, I don't I don't care if you think you are being addressed here. You are being addressed, but it's not only you. There are so many other people. So this is not a personal attack. It's just uh, that that man always made this point abstaining from eating pork yeah? um, and doing no work on the Sabbath and trying to observe one or more feast days in their own way. And very important is that the author says here, observing one or more feast days in their own way. And the further we go in the Sabbath study, the more you will see that this is absolutely ridiculous because the feast days of the Old Covenant cannot be observed without the temple. <laughs> and we have no temple like they had in the Old Testament anymore. We are the temple of the living God. Completely different. But people like to betray themselves. And I did so for a very long time too. So I do not accept myself of this. Please understand this. This video that I'm doing here today, and especially with me commenting on myself, is setting the record straight. And is telling everyone who watches this video, I make mistakes too. 
But when I spot the mistakes in the light of the Bible, I'm willing to correct them. And I don't care what anybody thinks of it because I don't want to look good in the presence of man. I want to look good in the presence of God. That is the only thing that counts to me. Yeah? And I am not taking any more, um, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it's not so easy to express my thoughts in English as I have them in other uh, languages running through my head right now. Uh, I, I will not uh, be patient with uh, tipping around words just to make sure that someone is not offended. I don't care if anyone thinks that he is offended. I don't attack anyone personally. Never have, never will, and I don't do this now either. But the point is, It needs to be set straight in the record that many Christians cherry-pick aspects of the law from the Old Covenant, such as abstaining from eating pork. That is one example. It is unclean meat. It is more than just pork. Yeah? Go through the list of the Old Testament to see what all was unclean. Or just go to the book of Acts when uh, this... Uh, Cape from heaven came down with all these unclean animals in there, and uh, the order came to Peter, kill and eat, okay? Because that's what this is all about, and we will see that later on in this reading also. So, it's eating pork, something that I did not address correctly when I did this first reading. That's why I'm correcting this right now. And yes, sorry if it takes a few moments to correct my mistakes, But I think it is very important that everybody understands that I'm not only sharing a, for many people, new message with this video, but also I'm setting a lot of my own mistakes straight. And this one is one of them. So, let's continue. The New Testament is very clear in its message regarding the law which the Sabbath day obligations belong to. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to the whole law. Christ is become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law. You are fallen from grace. Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. Paul was giving a very clear message to Christians not to fall back into the ways of the old covenant by trying to become justified through following the law, which he admits even their fathers were unable to keep as we can read in Acts chapter 15, verse 10. We are now justified by the grace through our faith in the fact that Jesus was the only man to ever live who kept the law perfectly, thus paying the price for the sins of mankind against God. Our faith is what saves us, because by the grace of God, The righteousness of Christ is imputed upon the true believers, so God now sees us in him, and we are accepted in his eyes, despite lacking the ability to fulfill the law personally. When Jesus was teaching the people about not laboring for food that perishes, but to seek out that food which endures to everlasting life, he spoke of the spiritual food the word of God, that he was speaking and that if understood and followed would lead to immortality. Many didn't understand as they still had the mindset of being under the law, so, quote, Then said they unto him, What shall we do, that we might work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he has sent. John chapter 6, verses 28 through 29. Jesus went to great pains to point out that it was faith 
that was required, not blindly following ordinances without understanding the meaning behind them, which is why he often spake to us in parables. Rather than giving a list of rules to be followed, Christ wanted his followers to understand the message he was bringing and to have a changed heart. The law was a schoolmaster to teach obedience to God's chosen people Israel, and together with the prophets they painted a picture of the coming Messiah that should have been recognized. The prophet Jeremiah foretold of a new covenant that would not be according to the covenant that God made with the house of Israel when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. This new covenant would involve God's people having the law written upon their hearts, quote, not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart, unquote. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3. Paul goes on to say that God, quote, has made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life, unquote. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. Before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster, for you are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Galatians chapter 3, verses 23 through 26. The Old Covenant, including the Ten Commandments, has now been replaced, but that does not mean that the spirit of the law and what it was teaching has gone. Jesus didn't come to destroy the law or the prophets, but to fulfill them. His message was one of an even higher standard than that of the scribes and Pharisees who had added more and more restrictions to God's law in an effort to earn salvation through works rather than by faith. Very same as the Roman Catholic Church does today, right? And the sentence that I put in blue here is, The old covenant, including the Ten Commandments, has now been replaced. But that does not mean that the spirit of the law and what it was teaching has gone. The old covenant has been replaced, but the spirit of the law still is there. Jesus did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill. So, still keep the Ten Commandments in the Spirit. His message was one of an even higher standard than that of the scribes and Pharisees, who had added more and more restrictions to God's law in an effort to earn salvation through works rather than by faith. The Jewish leadership were trying to follow the law to the letter and had become obsessed with legalism in much the same way the Taliban were strictly enforcing Islamic law in recent times. Unfortunately, they had lost all sight of the meaning behind God's law, meaning of the spirit of the law. Yeah? So when their Messiah came, they only recognized the threat to their own authority. Their authority was to push the law and to push people into keeping the law. Without the law, these scribes and Pharisees were nothing. So, this had to be taken away. This had to be fulfilled by Jesus Christ. So that the Scribes and the Pharisees could not hold the people in bondage no longer. That's at least how I understand this for the moment. Let's read it again. The Jewish leadership were trying to follow the law to the letter and had become obsessed with legalism in much the same way the Taliban were strictly enforcing Islamic law, uh, Islamic law in recent times. 
the Jewish leadership were trying to follow the law to the letter. But we could never keep the law to the letter, follow the, the law to the letter. That's why we were all sinners. Here and then everybody slips from that. So the law had to be replaced by something better. Well, that's faith through grace. The Jewish leadership were trying to follow the law to the letter and had become obsessed with legalism. Unfortunately, they had lost all sight of the meaning behind God's law. So when their Messiah came, they only recognized the threat to their own authority. And that's the reason why they crucified Jesus. Because he became a threat to their authority. They were all putting out of work. Thomas mentioned that many times. So I think it is very important that we understand here that the Jewish leaders did not recognize Jesus Christ because they had lost all sight of the meaning behind the law and were afraid that Jesus Christ was putting their own authority to, all, to naught. Jesus deliberately provoked them by healing seven times on the Sabbath day in order to demonstrate the hypocrisy of those who were blindly enforcing the law. I think this is a very important point, blindly enforcing the law. He gave rest to all those he healed by believing them, by, by relieving, sorry, he gave rest to all those he healed by relieving them of their afflictions. And from the end of Matthew's chapter 11, we see a picture start to emerge to the true meaning behind the Sabbath day. So we have to read from chapter 11 on in Matthew to understand the whole message of the new covenant. Where Jesus says in Matthew 11, 28 through 30, quote, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light." Unquote. Immediately following this statement, chapter 12 of Matthew begins, with Jesus and his disciples traveling through the corn on Sabbath day, and being hungry, they began to pluck the corn to eat. When the Pharisees saw it, they contended with Jesus about his disciples doing that which was unlawful on the Sabbath day. Jesus answered by explaining that scripture told how David, when hungry, entered into the house of God and ate the showbread, which was also unlawful. Before he departed into the synagogue, Jesus left them with a final thought by stating, quote, But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. But if you had known what this means, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. But if you had known what this means, that in this place one is greater than the temple, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. Matthew chapter 12, verses 6 through 8. Jesus was quoting from Hosea chapter 6, which speaks of Israel's transgression of, Lord's, of, of God's covenant and gives a plea to return to the Lord. Verse 6 says, quote, For I desired mercy and not sacrifice and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings." Unquote. 
It is no coincidence that the chapter begins with the prophecy of Christ himself when it states, quote, Come and let us return to the Lord, for he has torn and he will heal us. He has smitten and he will bind us up. After two days will he revive us. In the third day he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. Unquote. Hosea chapter 6 verses 1 and 2 Prophetically speaking, a day can be seen as a thousand years, meaning that we are now very close to the end of the second prophetic day or two thousand years since Christ's rejection and crucifixion in 30 AD. Remember the Agenda 2030 of the World Economic Forum, for example. During the third prophetic day, referred to by Hosea, Christ will return to set up his millennial reign upon the earth, which will also be the seventh prophetic day of earth history, as Jesus appeared after approximately 4,000 years had elapsed since creation. Jesus' 1,000-year millennial reign will be the fulfillment of the seventh-day Sabbath rest, when Satan will have been bound and, uh, and peace, truth and justice will prevail upon us. The Christian who now lives by faith can rest from the works of the law which will not return until Christ's second coming. During this time the prophets tell how the law will once again go out to the world to, un to instill obedience in readiness for Satan's release to deceive the nations once more. Throughout the book of Acts we see many occasions where Paul would teach on the Sabbath day, which has led people to believe that the apostles were still keeping the Sabbath after the crucifixion. As seen repeatedly, when we look closely at scripture, we find that it doesn't actually say that we ought that we thought it did with many doctrines having to be read into the text. Once again, as seen repeatedly when we look Yeah, I have a little misreading here, so let me just correct that so that this time it is correct. It says here, throughout the book of Acts we see many occasions where Paul would teach on the Sabbath day which has led people to believe that the apostles were still keeping the Sabbath after the crucifixion. As seen repeatedly, when we look closely at scripture, we find that it does not actually say what we thought it did, with many doctrines having to be read into the text. And this is exactly what I meant in my intermediate video. When I spake of uh, eisegesis, own Bible explanation, adding to the word of God, even spiritually saying, oh, this word means that, this word means that. It is not because they met on the Sabbath day and they taught on the Sabbath day that they kept the Sabbath day. But the Sabbath day was mentioned in this way because then people knew when it was. And an easy explanation for that is, of course, that Paul went to the Gentiles and Paul went to Jews living in Gentile nations and went into their synagogues. And what do you think was the meeting day of Jews that were still under the law because they have not had heard the good news of the gospel? Sabbath, right? They were meeting there, they were gathering there, they were studying the Bible, Paul was teaching them on the Sabbath day because they were all gathered there. That doesn't mean that they kept the Sabbath. There is not one verse in the New Testament that says that the apostles kept the Sabbath after crucifixion. And I don't know if it is because it was, it was late at night when I did that reading. It is late at night when I do this reading also. I didn't make that point very uh, clear. But I hope it is now clear. The author says, as seen repeatedly, when we look closely at scripture, we find that it does not actually say what we thought it did say, with many doctrines having to be read into the text. 
and where do you think these doctrines come from? Look at these verses. When we closely look at Scripture, we find that it doesn't actually say that we th what we thought it did, with many doctrines having to be read into the text. Now, this is the same quote-unquote problem, um, the same phenomenon that appears with the Trinity. We read texts of the Bible, and we read into it the understanding of a trinity because that's what we were indoctrinated with. Like, for example, John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, uh, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So then, because of John 1.14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, we understand Jesus is that Word that was there in the beginning. So Jesus had a pre-existence. Jesus is God. And that's the basis of the Trinity. We assume that, but that's not what the text says. The word is still of the one who speaks it. And the Father, God, Yahweh, spoke everything into existence. It were his words. So when the word was God, it was his word that was God, because he is God. So his word is God. And that word became flesh because it used the fleshly man, Jesus Christ, to be spoken to the people. So that God, through Jesus Christ, spake to the people. But that doesn't make Jesus Christ God. It makes Jesus Christ the spokesman for God, if you want to say it like this. It makes Jesus the one who speaks what God says, but it comes out of his fleshly mouth. Everything else added to that understanding and giving us the understanding of the Trinity is added by us. It is what we often think it says, but then we even have to twist the words. Just read it word by word and understand word for word. And then you see how wrongly, in, how wrong interpretation twists the meaning of the whole verse. It's the same here. Let's read it again. Paul would teach on the Sabbath day. That's right. But because Paul taught on the Sabbath day, that had led people to believe that the apostles were still keeping the Sabbath after the crucifixion. But teaching on the Sabbath day is just teaching on the Sabbath day. It's not remembering the Sabbath, don't do any works, you know, the whole fourth commandment. That's not the point. You can also teach on other days. But he taught on the Sabbath day. Why? Because the Sabbath day, because of quote-unquote tradition, is the day when the people of belief came to be gathering in the synagogues. So when all the people are coming there on that day, it is easy to have them right there and then teach them. You don't have to find another gathering. You don't have to call another gathering. It's just there. That's why he taught on the Sabbath day. So it says here, as seen repeatedly, when we look closely at Scripture, we find that it doesn't actually say what we thought it did. With many doctrines of our own ideas having to be read into the text. The text doesn't say that Paul kept the Sabbath. The text just said that Paul taught on the Sabbath day. Nothing else. If the text said, and Paul taught on Sunday... May, does that make Paul a sun worshipper? It is just a Sunday that he taught. Or a Wednesday. Or a Thursday, as we call the days today. I think this is one of the absolute crucial points in this document. As seen repeatedly, when we look closely at Scripture, word by word, to, title by title, 
jot by jot. You know, we find that it doesn't actually say what we thought it did. Because our thoughts are coming along with many doctrines from outside the Bible. And we are then reading those doctrines into the text and understand the text in a perverted way. And that is the subtlety of the devil. That is the subtlety of Satan. Just read the plain word. Don't add to it. Understand it as it is written. This is the message here. Very important point on page 6. Paul would teach on the Sabbath day. Okay. But that he taught on the Sabbath day had led people to believe that the apostles were still keeping the Sabbath after the crucifixion. But nowhere is it mentioned that the apostles kept the Sabbath after the crucifixion. But it is seen repeatedly that when you look closely at scripture, we find that it doesn't actually say what we thought it did. Because it is added, our understanding is added with many doctrines that are we going to read into the text, adding to the text in our understanding. And that is what God forbids. Don't subtract or add anything to the written word. Powerful little paragraph here. Paul who was well versed in the law, would go to the synagogue on the Sabbath day to reason with and hopefully persuade some of the Jews that Jesus was the promised Messiah. There is no scriptural evidence that Paul was doing this because he was keeping the Sabbath. But from the context it can be seen that it was his best opportunity to speak to the people and reveal the truth of the gospel to them. His efforts were often met with anger and violence because to many Jews his teaching against continuing in the law of Moses were seen as heresy. But the law is fulfilled. You don't have to continue in the law anymore when it is fulfilled by Jesus Christ our Lord. When Paul came to Antioch he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and after the reading of the law and the prophets, he was invited to speak. Paul spoke of the history of the Jews, and how Jesus was the descendant of King David that God had promised to raise to be a savior unto Israel. Quote from Acts chapter 13, verses 36 through 39. Quote, For David after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep, and was laid unto his fathers, and saw corruption. But he whom God raised again saw no corruption. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Unquote. The law does not justify us. Keeping the law just does not justify us. The law of Moses. But the righteousness that is in Christ and we in Christ, that justifies us. After his teaching, many believed, both Jew and Gentile, but the Jewish leadership raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of the district. On another occasion, when Paul was in Philippi of Macedonia, he went out of the city on the Sabbath day by a riverside to speak to the woman whose custom it was to meet for prayer. A woman named Lydia, together with her household, believed the words of Paul and were baptized. It is clear that Paul wasn't keeping the Sabbath in any legal sense, but instead was using it as an opportunity to reveal Jesus to those who would come together on that day. 
that is the point that I made earlier, right? Many people came together on the Sabbath day because it was their tradition to come together in the synagogue, read the scripture and be enlightened and be uh, and, and, and giving knowledge through the word of God in the synagogue. So it was an opportunity to Paul to reveal Jesus to those who could come together on that day. When you go on the Sabbath day in the synagogue, you will meet a lot of people. What are you going to do? Tell them the truth. You don't have to gather them here or there or everywhere. Just go on the Sabbath day into the synagogue. And is it one of the laws of the Sabbath, of the fourth commandment, to go into a synagogue? Not by my understanding of the Bible. Strictly following the Sabbath today comes from a well-intentioned but misguided notion that God still requires us to follow ordinances that were given to Israel under the Old Covenant. When a new covenant or contract is provided, the old is automatically made obsolete but far too many people ignore this and revert back to the law despite the warnings given in Scripture. So here I have to make another little pause from the recording and say something to where you want to put your mind on. Just think about the question that I'm asking you right now. When you go through the Old Testament and you go through the first five books of Moses and the second book of Moses called the book of Exodus in chapter 20, God is giving the law to the Israelites through Moses. Nobody denies that. Whom is he giving the law to? The Israelites that are gathered there at Mount Zion that are gathered there and wait for Moses to come down from the hill with the two tablets of stone, that they rejected. And he went up again and he brought them back again. So who was given the law of Moses? The law of God through Moses. So let's just call it the law of Moses. Who was given the law? The Israelites? The people set apart by God from all the other nations? Or was the law given to all mankind? Now it is not because all of mankind has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God because of the sin of Adam. That is something that we read later on in Romans when we go into that. Every man ever living in this world, except for Jesus Christ, who was without sin, is dead by trespasses and sins, or has been dead by trespasses and sins. But the Gentiles, the Gentile nations, all nations outside of Israel that were, who, who, who was dwelling, or we, <laughs> The people were dwelling 40 years in the desert before they came to the promised land. Yeah? All the years, all the time that they were dwelling in the desert, they had the law, but the surrounding nations did not have the same law. And when they came to the promised land, the Israelites had the law. And when later on Israel split up in the ten northern tribes and the two southern tribes, mostly Benjamin and Judah, Benjamin and Judah had the law, and everybody else in the whole world did not have the law. So why now all of a sudden we think the law was given to all the world, to all the nations, to all the pagan people who sacrificed to other gods? Where does the Bible ever say that? Strictly following the Sabbath today comes from a well-intentioned 
but misguided notion that God still requires us to follow ordinances that were given to Israel under the Old Covenant. The ordinances were given to Israel under the Old Covenant that God made with Israel. He did not make this covenant with all of the nations, with all of the world. He did it with Israel. Israel was a nation set apart of all the other nations because God chose them because in them the seed would be revealed that God already announced in chapter 3 verse 15 of Genesis. That seed, Jesus Christ of course, was to come out of a nation that was given a law that no other nation on the whole face of the earth had. Do you know how long it took me to understand that? Because today when we get the Bible, when I get the Bible or you get the Bible, anybody else reads the Bible, we most of the time start with the Old Testament because we want to know all the history and there's nothing wrong with that. But the history of Israel, the history of the Jews later on, the history of Israel in the Old Testament, is the history of that nation, because of the history of all the other nations, God doesn't say much, does he? Here and there he tells us a glimpse about what happened in these nations. He tells us most of all who were these rulers, especially in Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar and all that stuff, we know that. I don't even want to go into the details, everybody can do its own research and read the Bible for himself. But the Bible deals especially with the nation state of Israel in that time of the Old Covenant, not the nation state of Israel we have today, don't mix that up. That's something completely different and we come to that in another matter. <laughs> yeah. That's going to be an interesting study. And that already was an interesting study that I did with Tom when we went through the two books of Steve Wahlberg, End Time Delusions and The Extra, uh, uh, Delusion Exploded. But there, had to be, there have to be made amendments to that study. So that's coming also. But, but that's something else. But listen, when you pick up the Bible and you read the Old Testament, you are reading the story of Israel. You are not reading the story of the world. In parts, yes, of course, when you read about the flood, when you read about how these and these people went into the other nations, yes, and when here and there you read about the other nations. But the history of those nations, what happened there, we have no idea. That is to, quote-unquote, secular history to tell us about that. And they lie when they open them up. So we never know with certainty what happened there. We only know what God says about the other nations. But the point that I want to make and that I want to even stop the video for today with, and we're going to continue, we, we still have some five pages in this wonderful paper to go next time. The point that I want to make and that everybody has to think about, and please write in the comments if you agree or disagree, and if you disagree, then give me book, chapter, and verse, where it states that the law of the Old Covenant was given to the whole world, or was it just given to the nation Israel? Twelve tribes, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Was the law given to those twelve who were led out of captivity in Egypt, and after being led out of captivity, God gave them the ordinances and the law? Or were these ordinances and law given to every nation in the world? You see, and I don't want to take the epitome of the study in advance here and then come to the, come to the point, but the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament is that in the Old Testament, a nation was set aside to carry the Messiah until the time appointed. And when the Messiah came, he uh, redeemed 
the whole world to God. Everybody. If. And that is a very important if. If you believe in him. When you understand John chapter, was it 16, 3 or something? Which says, uh, so much God loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, uh, that uh, Jesus Christ and that whoever believes in him will not perish. Or John chapter 17, 3, where it says, and this is life eternal, Jesus Christ in prayer to the Father, no, not to himself, but the man Jesus Christ in prayer, speaking to the Father, and this is life eternal. This is the th this is the basic line of all the Bible. This is when, whenever you are asked, Jörg, what's the Bible about? Uh, whenever you ask me, Jörg, what's the Bible about? Or whenever you are asked, what is the Bible all about? Just give it to me in a nutshell. One verse. John 17.3. This is life eternal, because that's what it's all about. Eternal life was lost in the Garden of Eden, but Jesus Christ repaired this, just figuratively spoken, and says, this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the one that he is praying to, the one and only God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. That's it. So, to finalize this video, just with a question to everyone who's watching it and to ask them to put it in account. Who was given the ordinances and the law of the Old Covenant, quote-unquote Old Testament? Israel or all of mankind? I think it is time that you start reading your Bible again with your own eyes, not with any church eyes and then come to the table open the comment section and write what you have found until next time please study the word of god shalom maranatha we must start at the foot of the cross for our souls in danger we're at loss and when we kneel in that awesome place, at that very moment, you'll feel God's grace. Friend, let me tell you, you need to know, there is heaven, also hell below. Christ died on that cross to set you free from your vile sins and hell's agony. You're God's enemy without the cross. Reject Christ and to God your dross. Prison of hell he will send, just Christ's work on the cross makes amends. God hates those who try to enter in, the gates of heaven still full of sin. Only his son can take sin away, go to the foot of the cross this day. God has provided only one way to enter heaven's wondrous array. Except what Jesus did for us all, he paid our debt, so hell won't befall. Go to the foot of the cross this day, his precious blood washes sin away. We each need to think more of his cross, without our Savior, we're total loss.